Lecture 3, Homer and Mythology. The Trojan War is the ideal testing ground for the central theses of this course. One, that many of the greatest myths in history have a strong kernel of historical truth. Two, that myth or mythology does not mean false stories, lies, but that myths are very often the means by which a society conveys its highest truths. This mythopoetic ability, this myth-making imagination, is universal to humans. It exists in all societies, in all places, and in all times, even in our own day. And these myths convey higher truths about the most profound of human questions. And third, great myths and the great truths that they convey are very frequently conveyed by great books. That great books are often the vehicle by which these myths are carried on to posterity. The Iliad is the great book about the Trojan War. And I have a very clear definition of what I mean by a great book. A great book must have a great theme. A great book must be written in noble language. A great book must speak across the ages. I believe also that a great book should speak to you personally as an individual. A great theme. The theme of the Iliad is the meaning of human life and the relationship of the gods to humans. You could not have more profound questions that are with us still today. Noble language. Any language can be noble. Japanese, English, French, any language can be noble. Any dialect can be noble. But what I mean by noble language is, it, it, is that it is language that uplifts your soul, that gives a special meaning to the message. Today we have very little, very few examples of noble language. I must say if you go to most uh, movies, uh, you hear nothing but strings of profanities. Now, I have nothing against profanity, but Hearing these words over and over again are, as I walk across campus and hear boys and girls on their cell phone just constantly using these words, it cannot help but depress your soul, to encrust your soul with a sort of uh, uh, malaise of evil thoughts about some of the finest things in human nature. So noble language is language that elevates your soul. And the Greek of Homer is a sudden emergence, like a blinding dawn, of beautiful poetry, magnificent metaphors and similes, so beautiful that many Greeks memorized the whole of the Iliad. And every Greek was expected to be able to quote lines in appropriate places. So to the Greeks, the language of, of Homer was what once the King James uh, Bible and its language was to English-speaking peoples all around the world. And thirdly, it must speak across the ages. And that is most certainly true of Homer. Every fourth year at Athens, festivals were held in the, this first democracy in history in the fifth century BC, at which the whole of the Iliad and the Odyssey were performed. All through the Roman period, the Iliad and the Odyssey were the supreme works, and Virgil wrote his magisterial epic of the founding of Rome based upon the Iliad and the Odyssey. And all through the Byzantine period, the Iliad and the Odyssey were on the lips of every, every educated person. The story was told that at the court of one of the Byzantine emperors, a series of young girls were led before the emperor 
who was going to pick out his new bride. And one of the old men turned to another and said, Unamesis, no shame. And everyone immediately knew what he meant. For that was the words that the elders of Troy had said when Helen appeared upon their walls and looked out over the Greek forces. No shame to have gone to war for someone so beautiful. And in the 19th century, the Iliad and the Odyssey were subjects of study by the youth all over Europe, imitated again and again. The British Prime Minister, Gladstone, believed that a perfect education could be obtained just from reading the Iliad and the Odyssey, that they conveyed all that you needed to know about history and above all about morality. And on into the 20th century, though I do say that sometimes I worry that the Iliad no longer speaks to students. I teach both senior citizens and undergraduates, and I find they all have exactly the same uh, attitudes, and that is there's so many hard words, so many references, but I believe if you will open your heart, and I believe if you will not allow yourself to be bogged down by mythological names that you don't know, the Iliad will still speak to you about the meaning of life, the relationship between God and humans, also the question fundamental to that relationship, do we have free will or is everything fated for us? The Iliad, how does it begin? How was it first composed? It is an oral epic that was put into writing. The age of Troy is very much like the heroic age of the Germans. First 10 centuries of the Christian era, the Germans and Germanic tribes all the way from what we call Germany today to Scandinavia, even to Iceland, sang great sagas of their warrior heroes. And step by step we can see these sagas becoming longer and heroes attributed with more and more elements of the magical. And so too, in the Greek heroic age, there was this shared set of values based one upon war as the most noble of activities, two of courage and honor as the sublime values of a warrior, that a warrior was brave in battle, but magnanimous, generous, giving great gifts and expecting nothing in return. So the heroic values and the idea that what matters is the reputation that you leave behind. For honor in this world of the Iliad and of the Germanic sagas, honor is based upon what other people think about you. It is about your reputation for being brave, honest, keeping your word, generous. These are the values of the heroic age. I am quite convinced that while the very siege of Troy was underway, there were minstrels singing songs about the events of the day. And then when the war had come to an end, all over, all over the Greek world, minstrels began to take episodes from the war with Troy and sing and elaborate and elaborate in the same way that the Germanic minstrels on their harps would sing songs about the mighty warrior Arminius, who had defeated the Romans in the Teutoburg forest. So from the time of the siege of Troy, the tales of the Iliad were sung, growing ever more elaborate. Iliad is just a word for the saga or the material about Ilion. And Ilion is just another word, a synonym for Troy. It may be that Troy was the name of the city itself, the citadel itself, and uh, Ilion, the surrounding land. But Ilion is just the tale of Troy. And by the about 750 BC, a supreme singer of tales, perhaps as legend has it, blind, Homer put this material, all of these tales together in such an enchanting, fascinating fashion that it was taken down by the recently invented writing and thus became the Iliad. So Homer was a real person 
And the Iliad was, is not some composition stitched together by many different bards, but it is the work of a single creative genius, as outstanding as Shakespeare or Dante. So that is the Homer and the Iliad that he sang. It is an epic poem, 15,693 verses. So a long narrative poem. And to the Greeks, the Iliad and the Odyssey, both had the character that the Bible once had in the United States. The Greeks of the fifth century of the Athenian democracy, just like the Romans, five centuries later, looked upon the Iliad and the Odyssey as religious books, books dealing with the most important issues of God and ethics. So what is the Iliad? With the true genius of a poet, Homer understood that it was not his job to tell the whole story of the Trojan War. His audience already knew a lot of that story. No, his goal was to distill from that long war the essence, the true meaning of why men had fought around the walls of Troy. So he takes only 51 days in the 10th year of that war. Wrath, anger, sing of the anger, O goddess, the anger of Achilles, the son of Peleus, which sent the souls of thousands of brave Achaeans down into Hades, leaving their bodies to be feasted upon by the dogs and the vultures. For thus was the will of Zeus fulfilled from that moment when first swift-footed Achilles went into conflict with Agamemnon, lord of men. Souls of brave young men sent to the, to the nether regions, their bodies feasted upon by vultures and dogs. That was the will of Zeus. And the Iliad will tell us again and again that we do not understand, nor are we meant to understand, the will of God. And the cause of all of this was anger, wrath, the wrath of the finest of all the Greek warriors, of Achilles. And how, out of anger, he took his soldiers out of the fight and led to the death of his own dearest and best friend. Because he came into conflict with Agamemnon, lord of men. And so our central figures are introduced. Achilles, the bravest of the warriors, whose mother had given him the choice, she being divine, of either dying young and be famous or living a quiet life. And he chose without hesitation to die young and be famous. At the other end of the pole is Agamemnon. He is not king because he's the bravest but because he is the king of the wealthiest city. The Iliad is a real set of insights into human nature, still of use today in a modern corporate world, or perhaps even the academic world. Agamemnon is that CEO who knows he's not the best man or woman for the job, who feels threatened by those who are really better than he is, and will attempt his best to humiliate and rid himself of anybody who is a threat. The story begins with death. It begins with a plague that sweeps along the Greek forces. And the origin of that plague that will cost the lives of many Greeks and no Trojans again lies in hubris, in that outrageous arrogance, that belief that you are so powerful you can do nothing that will get you into trouble. 
a hubris that may not even destroy you, but will destroy many innocents. Hubris, outrageous arrogance, and the abuse of power. So it is that a old man, a priest, a priest of the god Apollo, comes up to Agamemnon in the camp of the Greeks in this tenth year of the war. The Greeks cannot spend all their time just besieging Troy. They have to a raid up and down the uh, coast of what we would call Turkey today, Asia Minor. They raid for food supplies. They raid also just for gold and for slaves. And they do it quite rightly because the coast of Asia Minor is part of a coalition led by Troy and the various peoples of Asia Minor, what we call Turkey, fight on the side of the Trojans. So they're, the Greeks are raiding the land of their enemies. And in the course of this, uh, Agamemnon has brought back a beautiful girl to be his concubine. And this girl is the daughter of the, king, of the uh, priest who comes. And the priest says, I'm an old man. She's my only child. Please let me have her back. And Agamemnon says, get out of here. I don't have to give you your daughter back. Get out of here, old man, or I'll kill you. So he humiliates him. Agamemnon, Agamemnon has no doubt dozens of concubines. Wouldn't hurt him to give this one back. But no, no, he's not going to do it. He doesn't have to. He's too powerful. So the old man goes away and prays to his God, to Apollo. Send vengeance upon them. Apollo is the God of wisdom, the God of light. But he is also the God who brings destructive plagues. His, one of his attributes is the bow by which he shoots down people with the plague. So the god Apollo strides up and down the camp of the Greeks, silently, invisibly, striking them with this plague. And the funeral pyres grow higher and higher and more numerous as Greeks die from this terrible plague. So a meeting of the war chieftains is called, of Achilles, of Nestor, the oldest and wisest of them all, of Menelaus, of Diomedes, of Odysseus, the most clever of them all. They come together and the question is asked, why has this plague struck us? And I hope you remember, being a good Greek, you will, as the first remedy, say, Let's, let us ask a soothsayer. Let us ask a man who has special vision into the ways of the gods to tell us what the cause of this is and how we can remedy it. So the soothsayer is called, and he gives the answer. It is because you, Agamemnon, have outraged this old man. And the only way to end this is to give him his daughter back. Well, Agamemnon is immediately suspicious. This soothsayer, why does he come up with this answer? And there in the, in the, among the chieftains is Achilles, immediately like an inferior, a person with an inferiority complex, the way Agamemnon is. He immediately, Agamemnon, suspects a plot. And it must be that Achilles is after his job turns upon the soothsayer. None of you ever tell the truth. You're all to be bought by the highest bidder. Achilles, this is your doing. You are the one who has brought all of this about and has had this, had this lie told. I am not the cause of this plague. And Achilles says, yes, you are. That's what the soothsayer says. And others say, yes, it's true. You have got to give back the girl. Give her back, Agamemnon. You are only first among equals here, and we vote that you give her back. All right, says Agamemnon, I'll give her back. But I will take your concubine, the one you lie beside, Achilles, and make her mine. Why, you dog-eyed sack of guts, says Achilles. I'm going to kill you right here on the spot, but gently. An invisible hand is laid upon him. It is the goddess Athena. No, don't do it. 
obedient, but deeply angered, deeply humiliated. Achilles puts his sword back in his scabbard. All right, take, take my girl. You'll notice nobody ever asked these girls what they want, but that's just the world of Homer. Take my girl, but from this moment onward, I will fight no more. My men will withdraw from the battle, and you will see how you cannot win without Achilles. I will stay and watch as the Trojans defeat you. I am going back to my tent. He does. And his men, longing to be back into the battle, nonetheless must sit there by their tents. Well, word reaches the Trojans that Achilles, by far the most powerful champion of the Greeks, the most dreaded, has withdrawn from the conflict and will fight no more. Now they launch their attack. And out of the gates of Troy, they come streaming, their helmets with their horsehide plumes, and boar's tusks around them, gleaming in the sun, with their great shields as large as towers, their massive spears and swords, their greaves and their body armor attack the Greeks. And the Greeks die, their armor clattering upon them, and their souls squeaking off into Hades. Homer describes with ferocity the battle scenes of how in their war chariots a Greek will be attacked by a Trojan, his spear driven into his mouth as though he were a fish. Homer has seen death on the field of battle, and he describes the black blood that comes bubbling out of a slain warrior. And the Trojans are just about to win. They are just about to burn the ships of the Greeks and finish this war off on the field of battle. Greeks rally, and it comes to a stalemate. There is some talk of Menelaus and Paris just settling this battle. Paris, also known as Alexander, is... Um, very handsome, can be a good fighter when he wants to, but generally prefers not to. And the attempt by Menelaus to lure him into a single battle and let whoever lives be the winner and everybody else go home, this doesn't turn out. Paris is, by the gods, sent back to his house, and there Hector, his brother, goes looking for him. And Hector finds Paris in the bedroom with Helen. And he said, didn't you know this whole fight was arranged and you suddenly just disappear? Yes, I know, but it's what the gods wanted. You know, brother, I don't understand you. You can be a good warrior when you want. Why do you let everybody think you're a coward? I don't know. I just don't have that same lust for honor, I suppose, that you do. Well, we'll fight them again tomorrow. This time, perhaps, we'll capture their ships. Now that I'm in the city, I'd, I'd like to see my wife and child. And so he goes out and looks for his wife and child, Andromache and little Estuanex. She has heard that Hector is inside the city walls, and she is racing up and down the streets of Troy, carrying the baby, looking for Hector. And he sees her, and they turn and embrace and the little baby just burst out crying, the little boy, for his father stills on, still has on his helmet, and his, he smells of death, of entrails and blood, of the fire of battle, and his face is grim. And the, he says, don't you recognize your own daddy? Here, and takes off his helmet and holds the little baby up. Oh, says the wife, when I see you like that, when I see how tender and charming you can be, when I see how of all the Trojans, you're the only one who never blames Helen. Whenever you see her, you're so kind and generous and gallant. I know you're not meant to die in this war. Let's please negotiate. Why can you and King Priam not sit down with Agamemnon and the others? 
and negotiate a peace. No, honor is at stake. And if we were to negotiate a peace, the Greeks would come back ever stronger and attack us again and again. The only way to end this war, for after all, they attacked us, is for us to win absolutely. Here, then just let you and me and the baby, let us go. Go somewhere far away where we'll hear nothing of these terrible battles. You know that if you stay here, you're doomed to die. Yes, I may die, but I'm not going to go away. I'm staying right here. Why? Because I want 3,250 years from now some pot-bellied professor to say that of all the Trojans and Greeks who fought at Troy, Hector was the noblest. And I want my son to be able to say that of all the Greeks and Trojans who fought at Troy, my father Hector was the noblest. And now I must go back into the bloody battle. After all, the best omen you can have is to fight valiant, valiantly for your country. So he goes out again. Once again leads a successful charge. And this time the Greeks are so close to losing that Achilles' best friend, Patroclus, says, please, if you won't go out, let me lead our men out. Let me put on your armor so that they will think it's you. Achilles agrees. Patroclus leads the forces of Achilles to join their fellow Greeks. And the Trojans are indeed driven far back until... Trojans countercharging and Hector taking on in hand to hand combat. Patroclus. And Hector kills the friend of Achilles and strips him of his armor and puts it on. And word is now brought to Achilles that his best friend is dead. He has new armor made for him by his divine mother and leads the Greeks out. And this time he sweeps forward towards the walls of Troy, and then, in hand-to-hand -hand combat, meets mighty Hector. Hector says, let us make this agreement before we fight hand-to-hand, -hand, that if I win, I will honor your body. If you win, you will honor my body. I will eat your heart, says Achilles. There can be no agreement between you and me. And Hector is slain. And Achilles takes the body of Hector and ties it to his chariot and drives it around and around the walls of Troy and then lets it sit there in his tent, hoping to watch it rot, still having eaten nothing or washed himself since the tragic news of his friend's death, now avenged, was brought to him. Suddenly in the corner there's an old man. Who are you? I am Priam. Hector was my son. I'm going to kill you. Go ahead. I have nothing left to live for. You could be my own father, says Achilles. I haven't seen him for ten years. I don't even know if he's alive. Come. Eat with me. Take your son's body back. We will proclaim a truce while you prepare it and give him a proper funeral. And so the Iliad comes to an end. The, as all of our lives must come to an end, with death. So they celebrated the funeral rites of Hector, breaker of horses, the last line of the Iliad. We have learned that death will come to all of us. What matters, Homer tells us, is how we live our life in between. What is the reputation that we leave behind? What are the achievements that we leave behind? What is our legacy? And of the gods, we know only that Zeus, like others, is bound by fate. 
He will not change the scales. Hector is fated to die at the hands of Achilles. And so Hector must go to his fate. And it is not for us to question the ways of Zeus. The beginning of wisdom, Homer tells us, is the fear of God.